we are going to look at large aircraft weight and balance programs. So specifically how to figure the weight and balance for not a small type of aircraft, but for transport category aircraft. And to start with, let's talk about some weight and balance basics. The center of gravity of the airplane is where the airplane is going to balance around. So once the, the airplane is brought into balance, as long as that center of gravity is within the allowable range, the airplane is fine for its operation. And the formula for the center of gravity, which you're going to have to know, is that the total moment of the airplane divided by the total weight of the airplane, that is going to give you the current center of gravity for the airplane. To get the moment, we take the weight of any object times the arm, which is the station, wherever in the airplane that object is at. Those two things multiplied by each other gives us the moment of any item. And so not only do we need the total weight of the airplane, we get the total moment. Um, so that's what the moment is. And when we, we see a weight and balance problem, you'll just see how we add up everything to figure out the total moment of the airplane and the total weight of the airplane to figure the center of gravity. Now you also are going to hear the term the datum. And the datum is our reference point. The manufacturer of the airplane, they figure out where that is. It could be out in front of the nose actually. A lot of times the nose is zero, so that would be station zero. Um, not always is it the nose of the airplane, but quite often it is. And then everything is going to be referenced from wherever that datum or reference point is on the airplane. Some more definitions to look at. We have our basic operating weight, and that is just the weight of the airplane with everything on board that is needed for flight. Not the passengers and not the fuel, not the payload. <clears throat> passengers and cargo are referred to as a payload. But the weight of the required crew, the baggage of the crew, the things like food, um, potable water on the airplane, fuel, <clears throat> fuel's not included, but fluids like hydraulic fluids, those types of things, that's included in the basic operating weight. And an airline might actually have more than one basic operating weight. I know where I worked, we had one that was for heavier, it was heavier because it had heavier silverware and porcelain type of dishes that was used for a fancy type of charter, but a regular charter would have just normal snacks and Coke cans or something. It was less basic operating weight because it was less heavy of what the some of these operating items were. Our maximum ramp weight, that's our total weight that the airplane can be loaded to while still on the ramp. Now the airplane could be slightly over max takeoff weight, as it leaves the ramp because it is going to burn some fuel during taxi, but it's not going to ever be loaded more than our maximum ramp weight, or at least it should not be. And if it is, <clears throat> we would have to make an adjustment to get the airplane back into our max below the maximum ramp weight. And then the maximum takeoff weight, <clears throat> that is the weight of the airplane <clears throat> minus the fuel burn allowance for the airplane before takeoff. So often taxi fuel is calculated out by the manufacturer and we just have a set number that we use for taxi. You take your max ramp weight, subtract that taxi fuel, and we would find our maximum takeoff weight. <clears throat> a few more definitions before we actually start looking at problems. The mean aerodynamic cord, that's the average cord length of a tapered and swept wing. So the the airplanes that we are using for transport category airplane, for the most part, <clears throat> they have a swept wing because they're a higher speed airplane. And we have to take a look at an average cord length instead of just a rectangular wing. So that's the reason for a mean aerodynamic cord. It's an average cord length. The leading edge of the mean aerodynamic cord, <clears throat> that's a reference point that we use for determining where the center of gravity for the airplane falls along the wing. Again, because the rectangular wing is not on the transport category airplane, but instead it would be a swept wing, we want to look at the this reference point <clears throat> along, our, along our wing. And that's the leading edge of the mean aerodynamic cord. And you'll see this in some problems that we're about to get to. And also you'll see the abbreviation STAB for stabilizer. 
<clears throat> it's referred to in several test problems. That's the where this picture is actually showing you a tail air. Uh, <clears throat> we see the stabilizer here, and you can see that actually the stabilizer is movable to a different setting that the pilots can set before takeoff according to however the airplane is loaded. So for question 8697, we're going to use a printed copy of figure 414. And I would encourage you to print out one of these so that you can follow along and record our weight and balance that we're going to do. If you are taking the, the actual dispatcher knowledge test or the ATP knowledge test, the proctor will give you copies of this figure to use for your calculations if you request it. <clears throat> This is the question it wants to know with the load weights shown. You fill the fuel tanks to maximum fuel to remain under the max gross weight and you find the center of gravity. And load weights shown, what they mean is to use the right hand side of this figure for the pilot weight and the other weights. So on figure 414, we're going to use this figure to record and do the calculations. And like I said, you can ask for a blank form to use in taking the test. So our problem specified that we have full fuel. So we look at this weight and moment table that gives us our fuel. And you can see that we have gallons given to us as well as the weight and then a moment. And from this, we are gonna figure out that our problem specified full fuel. So we can see that 332 gallons is 2,224 pounds. And our moment is given to us for 51.7. Now notice that it does say moment inch pound over 1,000. <clears throat> and that's a key thing, which you're gonna see later, but for now, just the moment is actually 451.7 inch pounds divided by 1,000. So we're gonna go back to 414 at this point. If you've got your paper, write this in there and follow along with me as I do this problem. But we're gonna add our usable fuel in the weight in pounds as well as the moment and record that on figure 414. Now it's a matter of going and figuring out each one along here. So now they wanted to know the pilot. So let's look at the pilot. It told us on figure 414 that the pilot weighs 200 pounds. So we find that on our table and we see that the pilot in this location, he has a moment of 27.1 inch pounds over a thousand again. So we can record that on figure 414. Again, it's in inch pounds over a thousand. So we have our weight already given to us and now our moment for the pilot is 27.1. Now we're gonna add up the weights to calculate our total airplane weight. So let me get my calculator and we will add up 5,005 plus 2,224 and 200 and we get a total airplane weight of 7429 and then for our moments we're going to add those up 929.4 plus 451.7 plus 27.1 and we get 1408.2 and this is in inch pounds over 1000 so <clears throat> important to notice here we actually take 1,408.2 and we are going to multiply that by 1,000 to actually get our total moment. So we got 1408.2 and we're going to get to how we <clears throat> what we do with that inch pounds over a thousand in a moment. If we take a look at figure 405 in the FAA figure book we see that <clears throat> for our problem today, we calculated our airplane's total weight at 7,429 pounds. And if we look at this table, we can see that our max ramp weight is 4,000 or is 8,785 pounds, <clears throat> max takeoff weight 8,750. So our total weight at 7,429 is well under our max gross takeoff weight. Now we're gonna calculate our center of gravity. So I said before, <clears throat> we were gonna have to do something with this 1408.2 inch pounds over a thousand. And what we're gonna do is take 1408.2 and now we're gonna multiply it by a thousand since we have inch pounds over a thousand. And then 
<clears throat> we are going to take this and divide by our airplane's total weight today of 74.29. So remember, our moments divided by our weight gives us our center of gravity. And our center of gravity today I calculate to be 189.5, almost 190. <clears throat> so 1402, 1408.2 times 1,000, we get this large number. Moment divided by weight is CG. So we divide it, we get 189.55. And we're going to plot a CG and the weight on this chart over here, our center of gravity limits chart. And we're going to notice that it is slightly outside our center of gravity limits, actually. Uh, the FAA really doesn't have a great correct answer on this one, but it actually has one that mentions changing our cargo pod loading, which is probably all that we need to do to get it in our center of gravity limits. So you'll see here 189.55 coming straight up on this graph to our weight of the airplane, which is just under 7,500 pounds. It has given us a location that is just slightly outside of our limits for the airplane. <clears throat> All right, moving on to question 8699 is actually the exact same thing, except for we are just going to add up more items because we have now a front seat passenger, we have cargo in zone one, we have zone two cargo and so on, and we have cargo in the pod. Now I'm not going to go through every single part of this as, as uh, slowly as we did before, but it's basically very similar. Now, one thing that's important to notice on this one, this time they've told us the pilot weighs 190 pounds, but this 190 pound weight is not listed on this table. Instead, we are given an arm of 135.5 for the place where the pilot is sitting. So if we looked back at the beginning slides where we talked about to get the moment, we do the weight times the arm or the station, that's going to give us our moment. So we have 190 pounds, we have an arm of 135.5 inches from this table, and if you multiply those, we get 25,745. If we divide that by 1,000, that gives us 25.8. That again converts to moment over 1,000. So now we know for a 190 pound pilot, the the airplane's moment for the moment for a 190 pound pilot is 25.8. And we would repeat the process for a front seat passenger weight of 200 pounds. Now I'm going to go back to figure 414 and enter that information. <clears throat> so 190 pounds for our pilot, which is in seat one, and we calculated our moment. And now we said that the front passenger in there is in <clears throat> is 200 pounds. And if we actually we could get the total moment from the previous chart or we could calculate it. So 200 pounds for that front seat passenger. We said the arm was 135.5 and I get 27,100. Divide it by 1,000 because we want moment over 1,000 again and we get 27.1. And that's what we record here. Okay, so now moving on, we've got the front seat people. Let's move on to the fuel. Our problem specified 180 gallons. Simple because it's right here. Same process as before. We're just noting the weight and our moment in inch pounds. And we go back to figure 414 and record it. Here's our, use, here's our fuel of 180 gallons. The weight and the moment. Now we're gonna find all the cargo zones. And again, we have given weight. So zone one gives us 180 pounds. Notice again, it's not calculated on this chart out for us. So we're going to just do the math. So we have 180 pounds of cargo. <clears throat> and we are given that zone one has an arm of 172 inches. So 180 pounds of cargo times 172.1 inches. <clears throat> we get a moment of 30,978. Dividing it by 1,000 and we get basically 31.0 <clears throat> once we round.
Okay, so we have a moment of 31 for our zone one cargo of 180 pounds. Repeat that for our additional zones, and we're gonna enter this into our figure 414. So I've actually put in all the different cargo weights at this point for the cabin cargo. And now I'm gonna input all my different moments. If you'd like to pause this and go ahead and calculate zone two, three, four, and six, zone five doesn't have anything in it. But if you'd like to go ahead and pause the video and do that, you feel welcome to do that. And then you can resume it. So we'll go back to the cargo pod next. Cargo pod, same procedure as we did in the cabin cargo. We again find all the cargo zone moments for the pod. So zone A is 100 pounds. Actually, this one's easy because it's shown right here on our table. But even if it wasn't, we just multiply it by our arm. In this case, for zone A, 132.4 inches. And we get 132, we get 13,200 inch pounds. So dividing that by 1,000, the moment is 13.2. And we're going to add that onto figure 414. So here's all our cargo pod zones and weights for them. And then we're going to record here our moments. And again, if you want more practice calculating the moments for each one, pause it and work through it. There is a homework problem very similar to this where you're going to calculate it out anyway. All right, so now we've got everything we need. We have no passengers. Our cabin's filled with cargo. We're in a cargo configuration. Now we're going to do is add up all the weights and all the moments for our total weight. We get 8704. I would encourage you to just practice with your calculator. You cannot use the TI-89 or 86 or 84 or 83 or 92. You have to use a basic normal calculator with no memory functions. So practice with your calculator till you're comfortable. Make sure you know how to do it for when you do the actual FAA test. But for this one, we're going to calculate it out <clears throat> to 8704 in our total weight. Our total moments add up to 1744.4, and we have to multiply that moment by 1,000. <clears throat> so we have 1744.4, multiply it by 1,000, and then divide it by our total weight. And <clears throat> we get a center of gravity of 200.4. And that is our location for the CG for this loading. And that is one of the FAA answers. <clears throat> All right, moving on to question 8626. <clears throat> it wants to know what is the stab trim setting for operating conditions R4? So totally different type of problem. Let's look at how we calculate a stab trim setting. First, <clears throat> you're going to have to know this formula for finding the percent Mach. Our center of gravity in inches aft of the leading edge of the mean aerodynamic cord, <clears throat> we actually do the center of gravity station and subtract the Lee Mach. So for this formula, that's what we're going to do. And then we're going to convert the center of gravity in percent of Mac by dividing by the mean aerodynamic cord. So in this case, <clears throat> we are given the center of gravity for condition R4, it's 657.2, and we are given the leading edge of the mean aerodynamic cord, it's at 625.0, and it's given to you right on this, this figure that you get. So if we take 657.2, we subtract out 625, we're going to get 32.2. And so that is our center of gravity in inches aft of the leading edge of the mean aerodynamic cord. Next step is to actually figure out what percent of the mean aerodynamic cord that location is. <clears throat> so how we do that, we have 32.2, which we found before. We just did the center of gravity where the CG is, and we subtracted it from the leaning edge of the mean aerodynamic cord. How far back on that cord is our center of gravity? And we get that it's 32.2. Also, this table shows us the length of this airplane's mean aerodynamic cord is 134. 
And what we want is a percent of mean aerodynamic chord because our stab trim setting chart is given in percent Mac. So in order to do that, we are just gonna do, again, a, a bit of simple math. <clears throat> we take 32.2 from before, we divide it by 134. Again, it came from the bottom of figure 53 for our entire length of the mean aerodynamic chord, and we get 24%. <clears throat> so today, the center of gravity is at 24% of mean aerodynamic chord. And at that point, <clears throat> you can take a look at the stab trim setting chart. So 24% of mean aerodynamic chord <clears throat> gives us four and a half ANU, <clears throat> which actually means airplane nose up units. So <clears throat> that means that our setting is four and a half airplane nose up. <clears throat> and that's how you do a percent Mac. There are some test example type problems that you can do on the homework that's uh, part of this section and so you'll be able to do a little practice with that. <clears throat> All right, question 8700 is a weighty sh weight shift question. We are going to just use the answer from a previous question which was the one where we computed the center of gravity for the Cessna caravan that was loaded with cargo and we are going to use a weight shift formula <clears throat> which is something that you will have to know if you're going to be able to do these weight shift problems. So on one side of our equal sign, we have weights. We have the weight that we're gonna shift. <clears throat> it's on top of our total weight. On the other side of our equation is the change in center of gravity and the distance the weight is shifted. So if we want to just move something, we're going to wanna know the change in the center of gravity. So that's the part that we're gonna to wanna to figure out here. This question asks us to move 300 pounds from zone two to zone three. And I've copied down the stations, which you could get from the tables that I think it's figure 410 uh, or 411. This is just a formula that you will have to memorize, but let's look at how to actually use this formula. So we are again moving 300 pounds from zone two to zone three. So here you can see that we do have our weight that we're gonna shift. I'll highlight it here. We have our weight that we're going to shift, 300 pounds. <clears throat> we have the total weight of the airplane. We actually had calculated that before when we did question 8699. And our distance that our weight is shifted, we've got that because we have where zone two is and we're moving it to zone three. So we've got that as well. So that is a good thing and we can we can continue on then to our next step, which is to do the math. So to figure out the distance weight is shifted, I'm just taking the difference between zone two and zone three. And we get that it has moved 46.6 inches. Next, we can plug in our formula. So we've got 300 pounds over the total weight we had calculated as 8704 on one side. And then X is what we're solving for our change in CG divided by how much it shifted, which is 46.6. And we're gonna solve it for X. <clears throat> so for doing some cross multiplying here, basically we can take 46.6, move it over here and multiply it by 300, and then divide it by 8704 pounds. And if you solve it for X this way, you get 1.6 inches. So, okay, we know the CG has now moved 1.6 inches, but which way did it move? If we have cargo moving from zone two to zone three, then our CG has moved back as well. So if the weight has moved farther back, our CG moved back. And we had 200.2 calculated earlier from question 8699. Add it to 1.6, so it moved back. Our new center of gravity is now 201.8. Okay, and continuing on to the floor load limit problems. <clears throat> there are lots of floor load limit problems. And this is the last type of problem we are going to look at in this video. So you are almost guaranteed to get at least one or two on the actual dispatcher or ATP knowledge test. That's a good thing because 
These questions don't take long to do. They're pretty simple. As long as you know how to do them, you can get them right, and it's easy points to get right on either of these tests. So our three simple steps to making sure that we can get these correct, if it's asking for our maximum allowable weight, basically we have a pallet. It looks like this. And it goes in the airplane, and they want us to calculate how much floor load the floor can take for a given weight on that pallet. And it's basically uh, making sure we're not overstressing the floor of the airplane. So our three simple steps to success here is to get the pallet square foot. We can multiply the dimensions together. It's usually given in inches. So then we divide it by 144 square inches to get our total square footage of our pallet. Then we multiply the square foot by the given floor load limit. So it's going to tell us there's a there's a floor load limit. And then we're going to subtract the tie down things like the pallet weight and the tie down devices, which they're always going to give you. So let's look at some examples of this, how we do this question. Our maximum allowable weight that can be carried on a pallet, which has our dimensions of 76 by 74. That's what they want to know. But they're going to give you our floor load limit they're going to give us a pallet weight, and they've given us our tie-down devices. So let's use our three steps to get this question. We're going to get our pallet weight, or sorry, we're going to get our pallet square footage. Then we're going to multiply our square footage by the given floor load limit, and then we're going to subtract our tie-down items. Okay, so let's go for it. Um, <clears throat> so our pallet dimensions. 76 times 74, and for that, we are going to get 5624. So 76 times 74 is 5624, and that's square inches. Dividing this by 144 square inches per each foot, and we get an area of 39.1. Next, we're going to multiply 39.1, that's our area, by our floor load limit of 176 pounds per square feet. And we get a weight of 68.73 pounds. That's how much that we can carry on a pallet without over stressing our floor with a floor load limit of 176 pounds per square feet. But that's not the answer. If you'd put that, you would actually be wrong. You have to subtract out our pallet weight and the tie down devices. So let's subtract out 77 pounds for our pallet weight and let's subtract 29 pounds for the tie down devices and we got 6767.8 and that would be the right answer. So again, we figured out our pallet dimensions. We multiplied that out. We divided it by the square inches per foot to get a square footage. Next, we multiplied it by the maximum floor load limit to get a total floor loading amount for that pallet's area. And then we took out our tie down devices, 77 pounds for our pallet, 29 pounds for ropes or straps or whatever is holding it in. And we get 67, 67.8. That's how much payload we can allowable to carry on this pallet of this size with this airplane's floor load limit. All right, now, if you get one of these questions that asks for the minimum floor load limit to carry a pallet, it's just, very similar, <clears throat> but instead they're going to actually give you a total weight for a pallet. <clears throat> so in this example, let's say on our pallet they said, all right, you can carry 67, 67. Okay, <clears throat> they're going to give us tie-down devices. So for that problem, let's say our tie-down devices were 77 pounds plus 29 pounds. We add that in. Then we actually divide this total weight by the area. So if it was on, like the other one was a 39.1 square foot area. If I divide that out, I get 176. And that 176 is actually our minimum floor load limit to carry the pallet. So I just worked that one in reverse to show you that it works either way. And there are some problems that you can do in the homework to do some more practice because these are easy points if you know how to do these. Not complicated and pretty quick to get them figured out.